what would have happened or what would you guys have think if they all got up here and saying, man, I probably had a lot of different places I could have gone rather than camp. I really didn't like it. Things weren't really good. The food was terrible. I mean, it wouldn't have stirred up anything in you other than saying, I really would not like to go there. I, I think I'll pass on that one. But they came with their hearts full and good things to say, very positive, very enthusiastic. Words have power, folks. Words have power among ourselves. Words have power with us as being Christians that we uplift ourselves. And that's why I want him to bring this up. This is something, as we were singing, that really had an impact. This is our voice. This is speaking to us. Many times we may wait for people to come up and encourage us and to talk to us. And young people, when you go out these next few weeks, there may not be somebody right beside you to say, you can hang in there. You can do it. And you know what you do? You stand up and you, re you tell God and you speak these words of truth and be positive in your words saying that He is my shield and my strength. He is my portion. That no matter what I face, that God is with me. No matter who tells me what, no matter what things are taught, I know that He is my portion. He is my shelter, my strong tower that I can run to when things aren't looking well. When the storm comes beating upon my life, that God, I run to You. These are things we need to reassure ourselves of in our lives every day. Our words have power and we many times don't realize what we have when we speak truth from the Word of God. Speak to our hearts. Speak life to our hearts. And not only those around us. Well, well, I need somebody to witness to. You need to witness to yourselves sometimes that God is well able to deliver me from what I face today. And help me through this. He is my very present help in time of need. That God has given us a special blessing. He has given us these words to communicate with Him. To have conversations with Him. To have relationships with Him. Can you imagine how tough it would be to have, communicate or to have relationships without talking? It's tough. Sometimes you wish that would happen. <laughs> would you just be quiet? <laughs> so, but other times you're going, I wish they would just say something. And the Lord, sometimes I wonder if, if He says that to us. I wish they would just say something. Talk to me. Speak the words that I can build that relationship with. God is wanting us to do that. And He has given us these words as, as part of the likeness we have with Him, to communicate with Him, to be able to express our heart to Him, and to be able to have a channel for Him to speak to us. It goes both ways. The power of words is all going both ways. Words are singularly the most, for, the most powerful force available to humanity. We can persuade people, we can hurt people, we can build people up, we can use them to create groups, we can use them to disperse groups, we can use them to incite riots, we can use them in our praise to welcome the Spirit of God into our midst. Words are powerful, folks. We can choose to use the force constructively with words of encouragement or destructively using words of despair. Words have energy and power with the ability to help, to heal, or to hinder, to hurt, to harm, to humiliate, or to humble. Yes. Psalms 12 and 6 says, The words of the Lord are pure words. A silver tried in the furnace of earth purified seven times. And as the silversmiths began to purify their silver, the first time didn't always get it. They did it seven times so they had the purest silver they could. And that is the words of Jesus. They are purer than anything we can deal with. He speaks to us.
in ways that encourages us, that lifts us, that we can depend on Him in what He says is true and there is no hidden motives behind them. There is no alternative motives other than drawing us closer to Him to establish that relationship that when hard times come, that relationship will be there when we can speak those words we have, that speak those words of maybe confusion, saying, God, I don't understand this. But you can help me through it because we've established that relationship through this time. You've established that relationship at camp. Keep it going. Keep it moving. Keep it working. And Psalms 19 and 14, I have this written on my bulletin board at work. Just a reference. It says, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. That is harder to do than read. <laughs> it's tough when people come in. I look up at that board and I start reading that scripture. I said, okay, Lord, I've got it. Thank you very much. But the words of our mouth and the meditation of our hearts need to be pleasing and acceptable in the sight of the Lord. They need to give honor to Him in all that we do. Well, I'm at work. Honor God at work. Honor God at school and what you say and how you encourage people and how you work with them and build them up. 1 Corinthians 1, 17 and 18. You're probably going to have to write all these down. I didn't make a PowerPoint and I've got a lot of Scripture, so you may have to write them down and go back to them a little bit. And, uh, and as you can tell, I talk a little fast. And so unless you're a, you know, one of those short, uh, short-handed people that, uh, what do they call that at work? Short hand? Okay. <laughs> okay. They call that everywhere, I guess, a short hand. So. But God is, is, is wanting to help us here to understand that we have power in our words and that we need to use that. 1 Corinthians 1, 17 and 18 says, For Christ sent me not to baptize. Before this, Paul was talking to the church here and they were starting to get divisions among them because they started associating with people. They started associating, I'm with Paul, I'm with Apollos, I'm with these guys, because they have a special connection to them. And, and Paul was saying here that Christ didn't send him to baptize. He didn't send him to start followers for himself, to move and, and have his own little clique going on. But he was saying to these folks here, you need to put that aside, because but he sent me to preach the gospel, not to withstand with not with wisdom of words. And Paul was a very intelligent man. He could have given a dissertation like nobody's business right in front of everybody, and you'd have probably had half the crowd wondering what he just said. But God is saying, and, and Paul's trying to let these people know it, you know, don't don't start getting with these associations. Don't start getting with groups. It's not what we do. The simple message is this, that Jesus Christ is crucified for us. And that is what the words that we need to come together and bring us together. And that's the words we need to speak among ourselves, among those around us, that Jesus should come and the cross would not made not be put aside. Let me finish that. It says, lest the cross of Christ should be made none effect. We try to tell people, try to work with wisdom in our, in our intelligence and the way that we can manipulate words, we try to present that to draw people to the Lord sometimes. So maybe we can communicate, in, communicate with them on their level. And God's saying, don't do that. You're not smart enough. You can't do it. It's not within you. But when we begin to preach cross, the cross of Christ and Him crucified, that saves people. Verse 18, it says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. The perish is not to listen, to, to think that if this, is, this is not for them. They have a better way they can figure out, they can make this happen. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. For those of us who's listened to it, for the words that had impact on us, that we seen this, that it was Jesus Christ, it was the cross that made the message, we have it. And dropping down to verse 21, it says, For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew Him not. You can't figure out God. You can't logically figure out God. 
it is way above us, way beyond what our understanding and our wisdom is. But it, it pleased God by the foolish, foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Now try to, try to logically figure out how somebody standing in front of a group or, or talking to somebody, expounding on the Word, can have an impact on lives and change people's life, change their outcome, change their view on what they do, change their spirit. Explain that to me. You can't. It's the Spirit of God that moves upon us. And God has chosen the, edi the, the preaching of the Word, the expounding of words, to make us do it. To, to help us understand more about Him. To where He anoints the person up front. He anoints your minister. He anoints your pastor as He goes forth. But He's also sitting right beside you, anointing your ears, that there is a connection with the words to your heart. That at what we speak, that God speaks from us, but then He, he listens and He works with us so that makes a connection. And we're going, you know that guy said something that I might make a note on that. That is pretty good. But God, it's through Him that we have this. Through our faith in Him and what we trust in Him. God, God feels like these words are so important that let's go and talk, look a bit, little bit about some of the words that God spoke. Because words are very important and powerful. God spoke words to create and to bless and to strengthen and to establish worship through His words, through praise. Genesis 1 and 3. It says, and God said, let there be light. And there was. There was light. He created everything that we see, everything that we can comprehend. He spoke it into existence. That through words, thoughts are exchanged and become reality. This we understand, and by words we are able to better understand the power of God. Because He could have created what we see in a snap of a finger. He didn't have to say a word. He could have just put it out there. But words are important to Him. He wanted us to help use words to see Him better, to understand Him better in what we do. Genesis 3 and 8. And they heard, speaking of Adam and Eve, then they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. So they had a relationship with Him. They spoke with Him. He spoke with them. There was a closeness there. And, then, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord amongst the trees in the garden. So this is after they had sinned. Then they heard the Lord coming back, maybe calling unto them. And they're thinking, we, we've done something wrong. We don't want to be a part of this relationship anymore. That in the exchange of words, the voice of the Lord, it signifies a nearness a relationship. When you talk to somebody, you have to be in fairly close proximity. And if you do it every day, there's a relationship that you build with them. An understanding that you know one another. You can feel how, how each other's feelings and respond. And that's the way God was. And that's the way God wants to be today to establish a relationship with you if you will talk to Him. We need to speak those words because He will speak to us if we take the time to walk in the cool of the day. And I know lately it's probably been tough to figure out what part of the day that is. It's been a little warm. But we can walk and talk with our Lord, the Creator of the universe, and He understands us. In what we say and how we say it, we don't have to be eloquent in words, but it does have to come from our heart. That's the key, is we have to have all this come from our heart and work from that way. Numbers, the seventh chapter, verses 89. The seventh chapter of, of Numbers is when they're dedicating the temple and the altar for God. And all, if you read through there, it's a pretty long chapter right there, but if you read through there, all the people, uh, the princesses of all the different tribes come up and they offer sacrifices, sanctifying the temple and the altar for their group and, and as the group of Israel all together. So they're sacrificing this and when all the sacrifice gets done and everything is taken care of, the dedication is done, verse 89 says, and then when Moses was gone into the tabernacle of the congregation to speak with him, then he heard the voice of one speaking unto him. And this is not or heard like a whisper or something. He diligently and intently listened. 
When God speaks to us, our, our heart feels that and we need to stop what we're doing and diligently and intently pay attention to what God's trying to tell us. He's trying to tell us, save us from some heartache. He's trying to save us from some issues that we are about to face. He's trying to show us the way that we need to go if we just intently listen to the words He's speaking to us. Yeah. But many times we try to tell the Lord some different things. But we'll get into that in a minute. But then it says of one speaking unto him from off the mercy seat that was upon the ark of testimony between the two cherubims, and he spake unto him. So they had a relationship going on. They had a special part going on here. And so now we see that God has spoken to people. The Spirit has spoken to us and He still speaks to us. Well, what about Jesus? What kind of words has Jesus spoken? And in John, the 11th chapter, verses 38 through 44, this is where Lazarus was. He had died. He had been put in the grave. That his sister already come up to Jesus and told him he's gone. They had him put in a, in a cave with a stone rolled away from it, or rolled onto it. And so he, he come walking up, Jesus come walk up on this, and basically told him, you know, just believe. Just believe. And you know, when we're in hard times, and we just seem like we can't go on to the next step, many times God tells us, or Jesus speaks to our heart, just believe. Just believe. Hang in there. You can do it. Just believe. Have faith in what God has said. And verse 41, let's pick it up from there. John eleven forty one 41 says, Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid and lifted up his eyes and said, Pick up, pick up this prayer that Jesus had. And, and we talked a little bit about that prayer in our Sunday school lesson of the Garden of Gethsemane. And you can see through Jesus' life he prayed prayers for people to hear, to give them an example, to give God glory, to give, the, give God honor, and to be that example many times of how we should pray and that it's okay to speak out and to pray to God that, that our prayers might edify Him and those who hear us. And here is one of those times it says, Father, I thank Thee that Thou hast heard me, and I knew that thou hearest me always, but because the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. That his prayer was a witness to everybody that could hear him of who he was and reassured them of who he was. And when he had thus spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin. And Jesus said unto them, Loose him and let him go. The power of words that Jesus prayed change hearts and reaffirm with others that he is the Son of God. And sometimes we, when we are around people, we hear them pray. And it uplifts our spirit to know how they pray and the thankfulness that they are having flow out of their spirit and how they are admonishing God in all that He has done in their lives. That is uplifting. And so we too, maybe we, we need to do that. The power of words is, is reaffirming to us as well as to everybody else. We should not pray for a spectacle. But prayer should be glorifying God and bring others to the belief that we are serving a living and powerful God who is in control of all things. We pray out loud and the person that may be at benefit most from it is ourselves. Sometimes we need to hear ourselves praise the Lord. We need to hear ourselves giving glory to God, to give Him honor, to put Him in His rightful place, to make, you know, it gives us an assurance and a, and a satisfaction of knowing that that I've heard myself pray and it lifts us up to that next level going, God, you are good. We need to hear words. That's the way God made us. We need to hear words in what we pray and how we pray. Luke, the fourth chapter, verses 31 through 34. This is talking about Jesus in the, with uh, the unclean spirit. 
And if you look a little bit before this, Jesus had just been escorted out of, out of Nazareth. He said some things that didn't go over real well. And so those in the temple decided, they, it's time for you to go, Jesus, in Nazareth. So he, went there, he left Nazareth and he went to Capernaum. And so here we pick it up. As he came down to Capernaum, in verse 31, a city of Galilee, and taught them on the Sabbath days. And they were astonished at his doctrine, for his word was with power. It wasn't like the scribes and the Pharisees. It wasn't like these other people. It wasn't like the lawyers that can whip out these fancy words. His words had power. They had impact. They changed people's lives. They brought enlightenment. They changed what was going on that moved people people to action. They were powerful in what the Lord was saying. And in the synagogue, verse 33, there was a man which had a spirit of an unclean devil and cried out with a loud voice. The devil has words too. We need to understand that. That words go both ways. And at this particular time, this man that was possessed, this person that was possessed began to cry out saying, Let us alone. What have we do to thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. And Jesus, verse 35, And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Hold thy peace and come out of him. And you get to looking at this, and, and maybe you question why, but you know, folks, God and Jesus do not need the edification and acknowledgement of the devil. They do not need His words. They do not need His acknowledgement. But what He is seeking for is the words and acknowledgement of His people that are serving Him, that are worshiping Him. The devils already know who He is. We need to begin acknowledging who He is and work through our lives to recognize Him as the Son of God, the Holy One. And so in going on, it says, and when the devil had thrown, in the, thrown him in the mist, he came out of him and hurt him not. And they were all amazed and spake among themselves, saying, What a word is this? Has, any, has anybody said that when you said something? <laughs> like, what a word is this? This is incredible. I've never had anybody come up and say, Man, I'm so glad you told me that. That people are just amazed. At, at what I say and the way I say it. It's just, it's just not one of those things. But here they were saying, what a word was this. It was with power. And, and I appreciate what Crystal said during the testimony about the authority of the prayer. Folks, we have power and we have authority that we are not tapping into. We need to speak those words. We need to pray those words with power and authority, knowing who we are. Not as, as we are something within ourselves, but we are blood bought with the blood of Jesus Christ and the Spirit of God is within us and that's what gives us the authority to stand here and to pray like we pray and to witness like we witness. And if we don't, we are living far short of what God has blessed us with. We need to move forward with our words in what God has for us. So that is something. Jesus spoke, had a power to change lives, any authority to cause the devils to flee. And this same power can be in our words, the power of the Spirit anointing our words to where the devils tremble when they see us coming. There again, not because of who we are, but because who we are for and who is within us. And remember that. In Isaiah 1 and 18, that Judah has, at this point, Judah has started becoming uh, a nation again of practicing their own thing. Doing what's comfortable with them. Doing what feels good. Doing what everybody else is doing around them. And, and the prophet here is saying, guys, you're doing, this is not right. This is not right. And then he says in verse 18, it says, Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. And this reason, this reasoning is kind of how attorneys discuss things. It's they, they always throw out logic and law and, and they, they throw things up that they can, they can back up. 
and they have justifications for. And so here, the Lord is saying, let's sit down and let's compare what we have here. What do you have and what I have here? What you have is nothing. It's emptiness. There is nothing. Your words are empty. Your worship is empty. The God you pray to is empty. Your practices are empty. There is nothing to it. And then the Lord says, let me show you what I've got. Let me speak to you words of life and let me show you what I have available for you when you come to me and when we have that relationship and when we have that discussion. And it goes on to say, Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be like red crimson, they shall be like wool. I have, the Lord saying, I have something for you that changes your life, that will make you different, that will cleanse you, that will purify you, that will take these things away and make you clean to where you can enter in to the presence of the Lord. Matthew, the sixth chapter. Verses 9, this is a familiar, this is the first part of the, what we call the Lord's Prayer. And it says, After this manner pray ye, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. He is wanting us to learn how to speak to the Father. But there again, it, it's coming from the heart. The Lord has done all He can. He set examples of how we approach the Lord. How we approach God in, in, our, in our meekness, in our humbleness, but with boldness coming before Him knowing that He is our Father. That He is the one that has everything that we need. And when we yield ourselves to Him, when we enter that relationship with Him, He gives us that which a father gives a son or a daughter. <laughs> Mark, the fourth chapter, verses 7, 37 through 39. I told you I was running. Hope you have your tennis shoes on. We're, we're flying here. Mark, the fourth chapter, verses 37 through 39. And this is when they were going out on the storm in the, in, in the boat out in the sea. And there arose a great storm of wind and waves beat upon the ship, so that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow, and they awake him and said unto him, Master, carest not that we perish? And he rose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace be still. The wind ceased and there was a great calm. Many times we are expecting wonderful things to happen when all the Lord needs to do is say, Peace be still in our lives. Let the Lord know. Speak to him. Give those words unto Him. He may seem like He's asleep, but He's not. He's standing there ready for you. And when now we have the Spirit moving through this. The Spirit speaks to us. And in the King James Version of the Bible, there are 783,137 words. If you want to verify that, feel free to go ahead and do that. But there are a lot of words in the Bible, no matter what version you have, and they are all important. They are all there for a reason. Because the Spirit anointed men to write them down. And I've said this before, what better way to understand it than allowing the Spirit of God to anoint you as you read it, to open up the Word of God to how it speaks to you, and that you would be able to develop your spirit in with the help of God and the anointing of God to be able to speak the words of life to somebody, even to yourself, to uplift yourself that you know when you're going through a hard time that you can speak the words of life. 2 Timothy 2 and 15, it says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. The Spirit will tutor you. I never was really keen having somebody trying to teach me stuff uh, in, in school. It's like, okay, whatever. Do what I got to do. But the Spirit will show you. You need to study to show yourself approved so that we rightly divide the word of truth. That when we speak, the word is given out in truth, in proportion, in edifying of the Spirit of the Lord. That's what we need to work on, is getting that done. John 1 and 7 it says, The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through, through him might believe. This is talking about John the Baptist. He was sent by God. He was moved on by the Spirit while he was still in the womb. And his Spirit-filled witness brought many 
to saving, to, to know Jesus Christ. And even when he had the opportunity to be that people pointed to him and saying, this is the guy, he's going, no, it's not. I'm not it. And that came out of a humble heart full of the Spirit of God. And he gave them the words of life saying, there's the man that you need to fall at his feet. There is the man that you need to follow. There is the man that will redeem us from our sins. There he, he rightly divided what was going on in his life. 1 John 4, 1-3 says, Beloved, believe not every spirit. And there's a lot of spirits in this world today, folks. There is a lot of spirits that we need to try and to prove. We need, you know, it, and part of, of what this word spirit is, is principle. Believe not every principle that is out there that is being presented as truth. If we don't know the truth, we have nothing to compare it to. But when we know the truth and the Spirit of God is in us and helping us to rightly divide the word of truth, when these other principles come before us, then we can compare it and go, it just doesn't measure up. This is not, and push it aside and stand on the word of God with the principle that He has taught you, that He has put in your heart to say, this is truth and this is what I will stay, stick with in what God has shown me. But try the spirits whether they are of God because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And you'll notice a lot of people may say and may recognize Jesus as the Son of God. But the Spirit that is of Him says He came in the flesh to save you, to give His life for you, to lift you up, to bring that relationship back into retrospect. And every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is a spirit of Antichrist. Wherefore, ye have heard that it should come, even now already is in this world. The Spirit speaks of and glorifies God. The words, the confessions, what it reveals edifies God the Lord and God. It defies what the, the Bible stands for. It does not go against the Word and it will lift up what God is and who God is. And if something, a spirit or a principle does not edify the Son of God, get away from it. Drop it and move on because that is not of God. As with us in our hearts, there is a source, our testimony that God is good and moving forward. So how do we use words? We've seen all these things, these, these topics now. Stick with me here for a little bit. But believers spoken. How do we use words? How, we, we can use words in a negative manner. We can tear people down and tear things down. Do we use them discouragingly? Or do we use them as uplifting, powerful words that we have? Proverbs 16 and 24 says, Pleasant words, words are as honeycomb. Everybody likes honeycomb, at least a little bit of it. Maybe not a whole bite, but a little bit of it. Sweet to the soul and healthy to the bones. Pleasant words edify us as a child of God and they edify the person who we are talking to. Everybody likes words of encouragement. Everybody likes to have friends come up and say, man, you look good today. You look good today. You don't want some guy that comes up that's saying, man, you don't, you need help. <laughs> you, something's going on today that you need help. You need to go back and look in the mirror or whatever it may be. But nobody likes that every day. But the pleasant words are a honeycomb. Second Samuel says, Wherefore, art, wherefore thou art God, or great, O Lord, for there is none like you, neither is there any God besides thee, according to all that we have heard in our ears. So here they are saying, God, we know you're great. How do we know this? Because of the testimony of those people we've been around. And who is around us? That testimony that we give out is so important because that, as we heard, may be the only testimony they see of the Lord is what we live and how we live and what we speak and how we speak it. If we're always negative, if we're always tearing down the boss, if we're always making these 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 comments that, that just are not real uplifting. And they're going like, what church do you go to? But God is good. 
We need to have those words to where when people hear those words, it sticks with them and it starts working on their heart. The Spirit has a door open to them that goes on. Luke 6 and 45, it says, A good man out of a good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good, and an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. For of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. What you guys allow in your heart, what I allow in my heart, that's what comes out. I can think. I can try to, try to hold things in and know that I shouldn't say something. But then when that trigger gets tripped, it comes out without even going through your brain. It comes from your heart and it moves forward. And what does that, what does that conversation look like? Ephesians 4 and 29 and 30. It says, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And we all know that there's hearers everywhere. We're, very few times are we someplace where nobody hears our conversation. And the, we, we understand that. And if you minister, if you speak in a way that edifies those around us, God will be honored and glorified in us. How we speak puts faith in motion. Because Luke 1 and 37, for God, nothing is impossible in, in us. And so our words are powerful. Our words are very powerful. And if you turn with me to Mark 5, 25 through 34. This talks about that experience that the woman with the issue of blood had. And the confidence that she had. And some of the conversations that she had before she started pressing through the crowd. And I think that's important because we... We as people, we need to have conversations with ourselves many times in the situation that we're in. Like I told, like we talked about before, is that speak to yourself. Edify yourself. Lift yourself up. Speak to yourself words of, of goodness, of prosper, of faith, and of joy. Mark, 20, Mark 5, 25 through 34 says, And a certain woman which had an issue of blood twelve years, and had suffered many things of many physicians, and had spent all she had, and was nothing better, but rather grew worse. When she had heard of Jesus, so somebody was talking about Jesus. Jesus is a healer. Jesus is the Savior. Jesus is, is the one who has power. He speaks, and things happen. He speaks, and the devils have to run. He speaks with power and authority. And so she heard all this, and came in the press behind behind Jesus and touched his garment. For she said, if I may touch his clothes, I shall be whole. She, she began talking to herself. Things aren't looking good here. The crowd is immense here. But if I can make it through that crowd and I touch his garment, I know that I will be made whole. I know that there is power just from touching him that I will receive my healing. And straightway the fountain of blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of the plague. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that virtue was gone out of him, turned, turned him about in the press and said, Who touched me? Jesus knew the difference between people that just pressed against him and people that touched him. He knew the difference. And folks, there is a difference. Are we just trying to press against the Lord and saying, I'm close to God. I'm close to the Lord. I'm right here. He's there. I'm here. This is a good place. Or in our faith, are we reaching out and touching Him in faith, believing that He is my God and I will be here and I will touch Him for all my needs, for my strength and for what He has for me. And all this started with her talking to herself in words, going, if I can but just touch Him. I don't want to get close enough just to press against Him. I want to touch Him that I would be healed. And folks, don't settle for the press. Don't settle for being in the crowd just to go along and press along Him. But touching with meaning and with faithfulness. And when Jesus found her, 
Verse 34, he said, Daughter, thy faith has made thee whole. There's something special there again. So Jesus knows there's something special about words. He called her daughter. You are part of the family. You're no longer an outcast. This, is, this issue is no, no longer separating you from what's going on. You are now a daughter. You are close to the Father. And you are close to us through your faith. It says, go in peace. Things have changed. Your, your spirit has been calmed. Your body has been touched. And be whole of the plague. A lot of things happened here that Jesus made what this happen. And when it talks about virtue, that's kind of the root, root word is dynamic or dynamite. And it's used in similar words to notate an intense power, ability, miracle strength that God has for us. Sometimes we just need to reach out and commit ourselves to touching Him because we need strength for the day. That we need that hope and peace. That words are powerful. And Jesus had it. <laughs> How powerful are words? Genesis 11, 6-9 talks about the Tower of Babel. You're, gonna, you're probably saying, he's going to read the whole Bible today. Well, I just may. No. <laughs> God is good. But here, the, the nations are still, they have one, one language still. And they've come together. And verse 6 says, And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they all have one language. And this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them, and they have imagined to do. Go to let us down, and therefore confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad, and thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. And so here we can see that there was an important part of the language that brought them together. And we got to, there again, the Lord knows that there's an understanding that when we become one in our language, when we begin to speak the same thing, when we begin to fall under the same thoughts and ideas, we come together and able to communicate that without any variance in there, then a singleness of mind happens and things take place. And when we have that singleness of the words of God speak, then uh, to one another, there is no restraints on what we can accomplish for God, just as there were none here. But these people were doing it for the wrong reasons. They were building this temple, or this tower, I should say, to where they, they were trying to say, okay, we can do this. We're going to bring glory to ourselves. We're going to show everybody how smart we are, everybody how good we are, so we're going to build this tower, and we're going to stand back, and we're going to brag on ourselves for all that we've did and all that we've done. And how many times do we let our words or do we hear people's words encourage others to edify and glory them, glorify themselves or man? Our words are empty and do not come from a heart seeking to please God. We focus on our words and we become braggers of ourselves when our heart is not right with God. And so be careful on what we say. And just the opposite of that is Acts 2 and 1 in that upper room. They were all in one mind and one accord. And when the Spirit fell, they began to speak in other tongues. And then when people heard this, they began to come around and see what's going on, what's happening, what's all the commotion about. And then in verse 4, let's begin there, Acts 2 and 4, it says, And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were, well, and there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came and were confounded. See, God confounded them at, at Babel. Confounded them to where they couldn't talk amongst each other. And see what's going on. This, he, he, they, these people were confounded, not because they couldn't understand each other, it's because they could understand each other. So God works on both spectrum, both ends of the spectrum here on how He works. And the reason they were confounded is because that every man heard them speak in his own language. The Holy Ghost will have known us to speak the words with power and authority to glorify God in ways that people will understand if we allow the Spirit to move through us. If we allow the Spirit to, to give us that wisdom and understanding, 
He will help our words to reach out and to make that connection. At Babel, God confounded the language of people creating confusion. At Jerusalem, God anointed the disciples with the Holy Ghost and made them witnesses to everyone in their own language. He can separate and He can bring together on this. God is the master of all the words and what's going on here. Speak life. Proverbs 18 and 21. Death and life are in the power of the tongue and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Speak life to one another. Speak life to yourself in what you have that God would be going forward. And not only, you know, how, how do we do this? How, what's going on? 1 Thessalonians 4 and 11 says that you study to be quiet. That's tough. <laughs> that is tough. Have you ever had someone you're trying to teach something to do, but they always want to interject something? They always want to change what you're saying to fit what they feel like would work. And they're not listening to what you're saying. Here, it's saying study to, that you study to be quiet. Listen to what the Lord's trying to tell you. He may want you to go off in a different direction. Listen to the words of the Lord that are speaking to your heart and take them and then use them as you go forward. Don't try to change them. Don't try to modify them in the ways that you might think that are better. But go out. Listen to the words of the Spirit of the Lord in your life. Speak truth. Speak truth in your life. Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, that if thou wilt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Confession is spoken words. Speak to the Lord. Speak unto the Lord. And there again, back to Psalms 19 and 14. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord. That we understand the power of words to build up those around us. As we worship, we should say to ourselves, I have come to hear the words of the Lord, to make myself better, to be able to share the words of life and truth with others. God is good. John 17 and 8, the Lord's here speaking. It says, For I have given unto them words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. The Lord is passing on words to us to give us that hope and that peace and that confidence of knowing who He is and knowing who we are. That's the thing. We can understand who God is, but in our words and in our conversations and our relationship, He helps us to understand who we are. We are a child of God. We are blood-bought, spirit-filled people that we need to stand and speak the words of truth and of life. This world needs truth and life in, in spoken with them. And John 17 and 17 says, Sanctify them through thy truth, Thy word is truth. Sanctifies to set apart. The words of truth coming from God into our heart sets us apart from this world. We can't be a part of it and still have a heart that is leaning toward God. Just as a woman with the issue of blood said to herself, if I could but touch, I will be made whole. No outside voices or circumstances were able to deter her. Who are we listening to? Whose words are we listening to? Are we listening to the world saying, it's all going to be all right. Just follow what we tell you, do what we say, and it'll all work out at the end. Or are we saying to God, stand for the truth. Listen to the words I tell you and tell the world what these words are, that they are life, that they are truth. What are we telling ourselves right now? Too many people are watching. I don't want to make a spectacle of myself. You know, God, if we are in the Spirit of God and we're following His, His Word, that you won't be embarrassed. You really won't. God will be there for you and He'll help you work through these things. Or are you saying, I'll have another chance. Those words I wish never were invented. I'll have another chance. Or tomorrow. Tomorrow. Because folks, we are not guaranteed tomorrow. Today is when we need to have it. 
with powerful words from a determined heart, full of faith, tell yourself, I will touch him today. And have that thought in your, in your mind and your, speak to yourselves that I am going to touch the Lord for myself, for my family, and for my friends. If you'd all stand right now. And I hope that the power of words that God speaks to us through His Word and in our private time with Him, that He opens us up to see and to listen to what He has for us. He's got so much for us out there. There's a lot of truth out there. But there is a lot of lies out there. And if we don't know the truth, we won't know the lies. God is wanting us to stand here and speak the words of truth. Speak the words of life. Listen to the words that He is telling us. So today, let's seek after those words. The power of the words that we have that God would anoint us to use them to uplift, to build, to be that encourager and not the person that tears people down because that does no good. The altars are open if you'd like to come or you can pray where you're at. But let's just pray that God would help us with our words and endue us with that power that He has through His Spirit. Thank the Lord.